The air it screams, whistles, thunders. Fire falls from the sky. Mothers cry to God and throw themselves over their children to protect them from the rain of fire falling on the asphalt. Soldiers, trained in murder and hate, soldiers carrying their arms, are to be the people's protectors. When the enemy bombers are silent, the rifles of these protectors speak. Ordinary decent people, whose last energy has been burnt away in panic-stricken terror, are being murdered by the soldiers of their own country. What is the meaning of it all? Dictatorship, my friend. Welcome, friends. You're listening to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, we're taking a detour away from the Moonbeam Road to look at another of Pops's great bequeathments to me from his copious reading piles. Around 1982 or so, I was at Nana and Pops' house conducting my weekly routine of sifting through his garishly and sometimes frighteningly illustrated and well thumbed paperbacks when I came across Wheels of Terror by Sven Hassel. The book was emblazoned with a sepia photograph of a burning tank and tattered dead body of a soldier. It also had the bold and capitalised words, the book no German publisher dared print. I was probably around ten years old, and having already been introduced to sci-fi and fantasy genre stalwarts such as Robert E. Howard and Larry Niven, I was hypnotised by the imagery and the unforgettably pulpish tagline, a novel of atrocity, as the tanks of Hitler's convict regiment thunder into the inferno of the Eastern Front. I had no idea what the Eastern Front was, but was about to vicariously experience the hells of it for the first time. It would not be the last, as from that point onwards, and up until I discovered Michael Moorcock a couple of years later, also thanks to Pops, Sven Hassel became one of my one and only reasons to read, and I tracked down the remainder of his novels over the years. The rare power of Wheels of Terror, and his first prototypical novel, The Legion of the Damned, weren't really sustained by subsequent efforts, that were undoubtedly and understandably churned out in a successful effort to exploit the public appetite for these kind of books. As they progressed, they became disparate and episodic, yet still maintained an energy, with even the weakest efforts managing to convey a sense of emotional connection between the stalwart, apparently indestructible characters and the reader. The wild success of Hassel's novels didn't go unnoticed, and the late 70s saw the emergence of Leo Kessler. Kessler books are everything that a suspicious disdainer of exploitative war novels would assume Hassel's work to be. Violent, war-themed potboilers that were superficial, image-obsessed, humourless, and in generally poor taste, Leo Kessler books celebrated the handsomely uniformed might of the worst of the Nazi war machine, and reflected the worst instincts and obsessions of their author. British war historian Charles Whiting churned out over a hundred of these books under the name Leo Kessler, between the 1970s and his death in 2007, ensuring along the way that Sven Hassel's novels, with their similar covers and marketing by that point, rapidly became swallowed up by the turgid flood of these and other pastiches by genre novelists such as Sean Hudson, writing under his dubiously named alter ego, Wolf Kruger. There may have been a faint note of poetic justice to this, actually, as Sven Hassel's novels had themselves overshadowed the substantial works of former war correspondent Hein G. Konsalik, who was himself somewhat problematic, it must be said, and confirmed Eastern Front veteran Willy Heinrich, whose novel The Willing Flesh would later be filmed as, and subsequently retitled, The Cross of Iron. Sven Hassel was a pseudonym, and the Sven character, narrator of the books, an alter ego of the Dane Sven Pedersen. Like Heinz G. Konzelik and Willy Heinrich, Pedersen lived through the war, but unlike those two, the exact nature of his involvement in the conflict has been the subject of some debate. Hassel himself stood by his account of heading to Germany to seek work in 1938 and joining the German army, later deserting after the outbreak of war, and hence ending up serving in a penal battalion, the harrowing story of which makes the bulk of his debut novel, Legion of the Damned. But his harshest critic, the controversial Danish journalist Eric Heist, argued for many years that Pedersen never left Denmark, and his only service was as a member of the much-hated Nazi spotting police force. Since then, though, the credibility of Heist himself has been brought into doubt due to his reported Holocaust denial, and support for claims that the diary of Anne Frank was a fabrication. 
It seems then that the mystery around the real history of Sven Pedersen will likely remain unsolved, although the occasional technical inaccuracies inherent to his tales do betray him somewhat in the eyes of history buffs and World War II hardcore hardware nerds. Nevertheless, his novels are compulsive page-turners, and were in no small part responsible for an acute re-evaluation of the nature of the German soldier in the minds of a voracious readership, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. At that time, the power of his descriptions, not only of atrocities, but also the daily hardships of the Eastern Front Channel House, and his protagonist's hatred for the Nazi war machine, also struck a chord so far unplucked by novelised accounts from Allied soldiers turned authors. On his experience with Hassel's book, British writer Alan Sillito, author of Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, and The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, wrote, This is a book of horrors, and should be left alone by those prone to nightmares. Sven Hassel's descriptions of the atrocities committed by both sides are the most horrible indictments of war I have ever read. And critic Alistair McRae had a similar reaction. He said, It may be that this is a book that will make you sick. If so, my advice to you is to read it and be sick, for such sickness is humanity's only hope for a sane and healthy world. Time, criticism, deconstruction, and another twelve increasingly diluted novels may have reduced the literary and historical credibility of Hassel's novels, but their graphically violent covers ensured their discovery by a new generation of readers in the 1980s. The cover of Court Martial is often quoted by fans, and even by people who have never read Hassel, as standing out so eye-poppingly from other books in their local newsagent, that buying cola cubes instantly took on a more harrowing dimension than when that rack space was occupied by Doctor Who and the Giant Robot only a week earlier. And to this day, I never cease to be impressed by the number of people of my generation who were touched one way or another by the books of Sven Hassel, often fallen into the company of the 27th Penal Battalion via their dads or granddads. Even more impressively, I worked with a chap a number of years later who would become a close friend over time and right up until this day. Hello, Alan. Although a fellow Hull lad, Alan is half Danish and he speaks the language fluently and lived in Copenhagen for many years. Inevitably, the subject of Sven Hassel came up one night when we were severely worse for wear, and Alan said, quite blithely, Oh yeah, he's well known in Denmark. My dad says he used to go to the same swingers club. Casual khaki swapping antics aside, sensationalism and marketing were only partly responsible for the longevity of Hassel's appeal. It was his grip of adventure writing and sharp characterisation, a dark streak of gallows humour, and a talent for brief but vivid descriptions of extremely harrowing events that made the books live up fully to those lurid covers. In addition, Hassel created in the forms of Joseph Porter, Tiny, Julius Hyde, The Legionnaire, and The Old Man, a truly memorable, vicious, hilarious, and deeply human band of misfits that resonate with readers all over the world, and in my case, for the most part, over 25 years since I last picked up one of his books, the exception being when I wrote an obituary for The Quietus, from which the majority of this introduction is drawn, just in case it seems familiar to anybody who actually read it. So on this show, I've drafted my old mate Robbo in to join me at Derry and Tom's and take a look at that very same book I got from Pops all those years ago. Wheels of Terror. Okay, so we are in Derry and Tom's roof garden. Or are we in Derry and Tom's roof garden? Or are we in the Senna Lager training centre... Troops Canteen. Let's say, uh, for the sake of argument, we're in Derry and Tom's. Virtual Derry and Tom's, of course. But I've got with me an all-new guest who's not been on the show before to talk about Sven Hassel's Wheels of Terror. It's Robbo. Hello, Robbo. Uh, hello, Mr. Stimson. How are you? <laughs> oh, very well. Very well, indeed. It's uh, it's so interesting doing this with you because we've known each other for, for a hell of a long time. And uh, we probably... Over 30 years? Yes. And we've had many gases about many subjects over the years, but we've never done it in a podcast before. No. So this could be a hair curling first episode for me. <laughs> so bear with me while I get through my terrors, but I'm well, looking forward to it. Well, I'll tell you what, let's get some Dutch courage down us then, because I think it would be rude not to. Because I haven't actually spoke to you first to first since we tested your USB microphone way before Christmas. Therefore, we need to combine this entire experience with having a drink together, don't we? Yes, please. So, what, what have you got? Uh, I've gone for the uh, German Wasser beer, I think, which was uh, 
the appropriate drink, that or antifreeze, I think, was yeah. uh, another option. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> as, well, uh, a, as a tribute to our Eastern Front comrades. Well, yeah, um, f- funnily enough, I, I, we did when we talked about this, I did talk about getting some German beer in, but I've been so lax, I have failed. So I've got Seven Brothers Salty Tears, which says... Uh, Wipe your tears and grab this delicious blackberry and cherry sour. An addition of pink Himalayan salt balances out the fruit and tartness, resulting in a beautiful ghost. So I've got a salty fruit beer. I don't think it's particularly German. I don't think it's particularly thematic. But I'm hoping it will be okay. Mm, It looks like fizzy Ribena. That's a commitment to brewing, to get salt from the Himalayas. Yeah, it is kind of. It's actually all right. Yeah, I quite quite like a ghost, but... um, and it's not it's not salty to the point where it tastes of salt, so I'll view that as a total win. <laughs> well, it's Himalayan salt, so I don't know I don't know how good your palate is. Yeah. <laughs> if you can tell the difference, and I'm enjoying just the standard uh, white beer, Mr. Simpson. So cheers, and, and thank che- you. I'm very very much looking forward to this. Yeah, cheers to you, and uh, happy New Year as well. <laughs> so normally uh, the pattern is when we have a new guest on, is we talk about um, what their background and history is with Mocock, of course, because it's a Mocock flavoured podcast. So we might as well kick off and say, what's your relationship with Mocock? Well, I think you introduced me to him, Mr. S. Um, early on, I think, in the first first couple of years that we knew each other, you put me straight on to Behold the Man. Mm. I think I was trying to educate myself after a, after a, <laughs> an illiterate upbringing in our house, which was just... <laughs> Had four LPs in it and uh, a number of Mills and Bones, Bones out <laughs> <laughs> books that my mother would uh, treat herself to. I was reading all sorts of stuff at the time, bits and pieces of science fiction, and you put me onto Morcock's Behold the Man, which I uh, thoroughly enjoyed at the time. Hmm. But I was lost in reading all sorts of other things. I'd done a bit of um, reading of fantasy fiction, uh, the Conan books, and hmm. what was those fabulous... Um, Dice rolling games that you used to have in books that, that, that were the rage oh, of school. Fighting um, fantasy. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and moved on, moved on, yeah, done all the Tolkien stuff, all the general things. But uh, I found Mocock on a, on a that, 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 behold him, I was on a different level, a whole mm. different type of science fiction. And since you started the podcast, I've started to read a little more, but got very much interested in him as a person, really. Mm. I think we chatted briefly about this before. Mm. He just he, he he he's had a huge influence, I think, culturally uh, across science fiction, but across all sorts of other genres. And and he, he his encouragement of other people, his mixing and and his peer group that he was with, have had a huge positive influence, I think. Hmm. Gr- greatly affected, which links into what we're talking about today. It, from the war, I, I started watching interviews with him and what his influences were. I think you've mentioned a lot of them yourself, so we won't go over them, but. Hmm. How he was influenced by the Second World, because I think he was brought up by his mother, hmm. uh, lived through the Blitz, thought he had memories of seeing various things, which his mum, his mum confirmed to him that he had. You know, hmm. she'd taken him outside during air raids and watched various things happen, and then and then was grow, brought up in this traumatized, destroyed environment, hmm. and and just had this outpouring of art from him. Really, yeah, L- uh, London which, in the fifties. Must have been uh, an incredibly interesting place to grow up. I mean, funnily enough, I was I was only a couple of weeks ago watching Passports Pimlico. Yeah, and I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. But watching that, I mean, basically that is a story about people living in the ruins of the war. You know, you got the the, the chirpy company stuff, but all of the visual stuff in that film is is all ruin. It's all yes. it's all houses amongst ruin and wasteland. And I know, growing up in all, you'll probably remember because with a, I think you're maybe just a shade older than me. I hate to say it. You don't look it, by the way. I'm looking at you. I've, I've got my Father Christmas COVID beard. You certainly don't look a shade older than me, but you are. But you'll remember um, Hull, where Freetown Way is now, opposite mm. the new Hull Daily Mail. That was all just wasteland and rubble. Oh yeah, and had been since since World War Two. So there's this kind of you know this. He, he definitely was in that space where it must have had a tremendous impact on him. Oh, I think so. I think so. emotionally and, and politically it did. Um, you've mentioned his, his anarchist leanings, and you could understand why anybody who'd, who'd lived through that and been brought up through it would, would not want anybody in charge of anything, dictating and driving things in one particular direction. Yeah. Because it all ends 
inevitably, as it regularly does throughout history, in that horrible confrontation mm. and that horrible industri- industrial mechanised confrontation that they had that he would, when he was growing up. Mm. Well, what did he say about the 50s? The idea of romanticism in the 50s was it was a, a man in a grey coat and a... <laughs> And a trilby, mm. you know, so everybody else was trying to move on. I think, you know, that kind of drove the hippie movement and drugs and yeah. music and everything else that he was, like we say, a vanguard of, really. Yeah. It, it reminds me a, a lot, you know, not, not in terms of his artistic outputs necessarily, but um, things come through in, in the work of Roger Waters, which is very, very similar. He was, he was a very small child during the war. His father was killed during the war. He was brought up by a single mother in in kind of the, the ruins and the emotional ruins of the war, and that that fed his art as well and gave him his his slightly more left leaning perspective. And, and and the most fascinating thing about Roger Waters and Michael Moorcock is they've both, if anything, got more left wing as they got older, which is yeah. kind of the opposite of what tends to happen with with a lot of left wing people. And, and yeah. of course, you know, Roger, Roger Waters is, is still knocking this kind of anti-establishment, anti, you know, um, Trump particularly stuff out right right to this day. Well, it, it, I mean, it, we mentioned before we started about, about that, but that must have been terrifying for people like Moorcock, having somebody like him around again. I think... You, They've got. A, I think they've got a deep understanding of it, and I think, like you said, growing being brought up by people who were traumatized. Hmm. I think the other link um, into into Moorcock and this was you are mentioning regularly of your of your grand pops getting you in, into Moorcock. You know they were they were they lived it. Yeah, they you know did. he he's. I don't know what his. I got speaking to my granddad a lot towards the end of his life after after my grandma died, and he started talking about the details of what he'd experienced hmm. during it, which he he never. I think it took an awful lot. It was an outpouring, really. I think before he knew he was on his way out of what he'd witnessed and what he'd seen, and and they yeah. lived. They lived with this trauma, all of them, and and their parents lived with their trauma. You know, they, it affected them at levels. I think that we were not exposed to, thankfully. No, it's it's funny, isn't it? Kind of, I think back to when we were of that age, living in Hull, when we were, I don't know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, or whatever. And we had our granddads, and and most people that we went to school with, and most people of our vintage had one or two granddads who'd served in World mm. War Two, and and it was just common. And every day on TV was black and white war movies. It absolutely surrounded and saturated everything that that we did as children. And yeah. our grandparents, who we viewed as you know granddad or nana or pops in my case, or my granddad on my dad's side were actually traumatised and had been dealing with trauma for mm. for decades by the time we came onto the scene and it informed the way that they were and the way they lived their lives. Yes, absolutely. And I, yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that I didn't really probably grasp at the time when my granddad, when Pops, started giving me all these books like uh, Stormbringer, um, like Warlord of the Air, like all the Conan books, a lot of shit books as well, um, but also <laughs> Wheels of Terror, which we're going to talk about, was that these were books that appealed to him that at the time, as a 13-year-old, I didn't probably quite make the connection in my mind yeah. that he'd suffered appalling trauma. Um, and But this, these were the kind of books, these were the kind of politics of these kind of books that were appealing to him. But outside of these books, and that's the amazing thing about books, outside of these books that he read and that he passed on to me, he couldn't stand top of the pops. He only listened to brass band music. Yeah, he only listened to brass band music. He, he, he was in that respect, even though he was a lifelong labour voter like both my sets of grandparents were. He was as staid and conservative oh. with a small c as as people of that generation got. Oh. But his reading habits just opened up a whole different world um, of of what he was into. And it wasn't until my nana died she had a, a brain tumour. I was of the age where. When when I was um, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, when we were when I was eighteen, when I started training and we met, I was mm. still in the habit. I would I would stay there. I would stay at their house. I would either stay at my auntie's house or I would stay at their house down Alliance Avenue. And so I had a really really good relationship with them. And when she died, I spent a lot of time with him. Never forget taking him to see Independence Day, maybe <laughs> about six months after my nana had died, and he hadn't been to cinema since The Exorcist. <laughs> oh. 
yeah, that's a good last. That's a good last film to have seen, though. Yeah, so I took it to see Independence Day. And he thought it was shit. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, was, yeah, right. yeah. That was me expecting it to be blown away by the magic of modern movies. He yeah. thought it was absolute wank. Yeah, um, any, any war film that my granddad watched, he just he just took it and turned it off. It's just, yeah. just fucking gibberish. Well, well, my, my other granddad hated British war movies. Hated them. Yeah, he, he would only watch American war movies because he said American war movies were about the men who fought the wars, whereas British war movies were always from the officer class perspective, yeah. and the and and the other ranks were all characters were almost always played yeah. by the character actors like Tommy Trinder and people like that, <laughs> and he absolutely hated them. Whereas Pops, Pops just didn't watch war movies. Yeah, he that's just wasn't interested. Norman was the same. He, he, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't entertain him. Would turn him off. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd, be, I'd have boxes full of soldiers when I was seven or eight and stuff. And God knows what he was thinking when I was sat playing with them. Yeah. But any any war film he'd walk out, it'd, it'd rubbish, it's all garbage. Mm. You know, it wouldn't entertain it at all. And it, and it made sense speaking to him later on when he's, you know, he, he found all of it horrendous. Mm. And I mean, my mum told me that he'd thrown his medals away after the war. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. He went, he threw himself into left-wing politics. Mm. I got I got a better, I got a better uh, deal with the music. He was into quite a lot of jazz. Yeah, but but any art, massively conservative of that generation. Danny the Rue came on the telly, he'd turn him off. Yeah. that's not that's not allowed. Men in dresses isn't allowed. All all those type of ideas. Yeah, but but the but the deep rooted understanding of what people can do to each other when they when they're pushed into confrontation was mm. uh, never never left him. Mm. And and how we, how we manage, how they all manage their memories. They were very regimented, controlled, kind of almost OCD, and you know everything had to be right. Everything was always planned for. There was always stuff stored away for in case. It just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, M- music, music in Nana and Pop's house was either a Pop's playing his electric organ that he'd put he'd put together himself from a pattern because he was after the war he was an electrician at Ace Electric. You remember Ace Electric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he built it himself and built it and built like the amplifier that went along with it and these massive speakers. And uh, and that was the only music I would ever hear in that house except. The beginning of Crime Watch, where Nana would would air drum to the beginning of Crime Watch because she thought <laughs> she thought the drums were awesome. <laughs> that was the only music you ever heard in Nana and Pop's house. Never a radio on, never a top of the pops, nothing like that. Yeah, politics, news, and uh, the shipping forecast religiously. Mm. I don't mm. know if it was hourly or every half an hour, but that was on, and that he was ex navy. Yeah. So the shipping forecast was on every single time it was on. So it's it's interesting then coming across something like Wheels of Terror in his house, mm. and, and I've still got the copy that I got off him. Um, it's just to my left here. It's the um, Corgi edition from the sixties, with the sepia photograph of the dead tanker next to some tank tracks and bright red letters saying "The book no German publisher dead print." <laughs> And um, it's, it, so that was really eye catching. That was really striking. I remember seeing it there, and and I think it was there for a while before it must have been like on his reading pile or whatever it was before it actually came my way. And so it came my way probably I don't know eighty three, eighty four, something like that. I was definitely at the tail end of junior school, and I'd already been reading. I'd, I don't think I'd read any Moorcock yet. I don't think I'd got any Moorcock off him, but I'd read some Conan. I'd read some other bits and bobs. Mostly awful. I think I'd read some EC Tub Doom arrest books, which I can't remember to this day. I'd read I'd read Where Eagles Dare by Alistair McLean, um, mm-hmm. an old copy of that, which I found quite heavy going. I read it because it had stills from the film on the cover, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm having a piece of this." And apart from that, I'd, I'd I'd got to that point in reading by reading Target books, Doctor Who books, I had a massive shelf of Target Doctor Who books. So Wheels of Terror ends up in my hands. And I suppose there's there's some context about Wheels of Terror that's interesting to look at before we kind of continue and think about why it might have been so popular and why it was a bestseller in England. So, chapter one, Nox Diaboli, which is basically kicks off, introduces you to a handful of the characters, and they're basically, there's an air raid. They're, they're, in, yeah. tra- they're in training barracks, there's an air raid. And I was thinking about this when I was reading it, and I was thinking, so it's 1959 this book gets published. What 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 films have been out there about about the role of the RAF in the war that people would have been exposed to in nineteen fifty nine in England? You know, you're thinking Reach for the Sky maybe or yeah. or the Dam Busters. Yeah, I was gonna say Dam Busters maybe around that time. It was very much that staid, committed, and um, professional, well turned out 
crisply uniformed, clean view of the RAF. Apart from the fact that, you know, Reach for the Sky and the Dam Busters don't really shake away from the fact that pilots didn't come back and there's a few kind of, you know, yes. scenes where they're putting the crosses on the blackboards because pilots haven't come back. So you kind of had that, you know, the idea that there is a cost to the war and there's and there's a cost to um, the war in the air and everything else. Her- heroic sacrifice. Heroic sacrifice, yeah, yeah absolutely. That, 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 that. Yeah, so, and, and, and what you know they're doing is they're, they're, they're shooting down Jerry because he's yeah. invading, or they're blowing up dams for reasons yeah. that are indistinct, but you know they've got to blow up the dams. A massive high risk to themselves, but for the yeah. greater good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I suppose in books, you know, what 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 were the what were the popular books back then? Authors like Douglas Reeman, you know, like sort of Royal Navy books. Um, yeah, officers' memoirs. Officers' me- <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. And very much what they do now today, you know, they'll be edited through. I mean, they're very, you know, all these Bravo two zero and all these these war memoirs now they're all edited and go through the Ministry of Defence before they're allowed to be published by the publishing houses you know they're, they're not what <laughs> they're not what comes out of this book at all yeah so so chapter one kicks off so and I, when I was reading it again earlier I was putting myself in my 13 year old head and um, it's, it's not difficult to remember why this had such an impact on me you only have to read a few passages from this and it pretty much explains oh, why I'm a 13 year old's mind would be blown by what they're I, reading I, well I was tra- I'm trying to get my head around the fact that you read this at 13 because I, I, in my line of work I've come across a lot of well I've done a conversation with my granddad I've come across a lot of ex-veterans who've been through Iraq and Afghanistan and, yeah. um, and I've got a friend um, who, who was a, a boy throughout a, a civil war in Africa mm-hmm. um, and just some of the stuff he describes I mean, I'll let you read uh, read read what you've got there but I've, yeah. I've been recently read it but Jesus that was the lad from Sierra Leone, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, remarkable, remarkable kid. Who, I mean, we've, I've, I've managed to avoid plague, pestilence, war, you know, famine. Yeah. He'd done them. He'd done them all before he'd done his adolescence. Yeah. Um, and yeah. still does them. But. Uh, yeah. So chapter one, Knox Diaboli starts off with we we get a brief introduction to some some of these characters playing a card game called Scat, which I really need to look up. Um, because to me, I'm reading it, they're just calling out numbers, it makes no sense to me. But you, you, you instantly get a feel that this, this book isn't the typical British war novel of the time. Because number one, they're re- referring to each other as bloody whores. Um, that you do get some really creative insults <laughs> thrown around in these books. There is, there is what you would expect to be, yeah, yeah some reasonably authentic military chat yeah. between between yeah. less than working class men, yeah, uh, yeah, in, in <laughs> under pressure. Yeah, and one of the really fascinating things about this as well is the fact that, of course, these are translated from Danish, yeah, because Sven Hassel was Danish, and this this copy was translated by I O Hanlon. Now, O'Hanlon has an excellent grasp of British slang vernacular because mm. there is so much British slang in this as part of the, the translations. So we're introduced to Porter, who's calling someone a bloody whore. We're introduced to Stage, Hugo Stage, who's a, a, a fairly regular character in the books, but not in all yeah. of them. Porter is a core character. He's in everything. He's one of the most colourful characters across all the Sven Hassel novels. A guy called Merla. Don't remember yeah. him from any of the other books. The old un, who's alternately called the old un, and the old man, who's kind of like the moral core of this gang of men who who go across thirteen novels, and of course the Sven himself. There's a I don't think we get a reference to any of the others at this point, but there's but there's an air raid, so everybody runs around. They all realise that they've got to get out there, and it says I'll just read this a little bit. At once, the company's two hundred men split up and rushed in all directions to slit trenches or even just heaps of soil. We soldiers were afraid of what were called air raid shelters. We preferred the open trenches to the cellars, which we regarded as rat traps. And then hell loosed itself. Round us the enormous explosion streaked and thundered. The bombs fell like a blanket over the city. In a moment everything was lit by the blood-red light from the great sea of flames. Crouching in our trenches, it looked as though the whole world was disintegrating in front of our eyes. For miles around, the explosive and incendiary bombs illuminated the condemned city. No words could ever describe that horror. The phosphorus of the incendiary spurted like fountains in the air and spread an inferno. Asphalt, stone, people, trees, even glass went up in flames. Then the high explosives followed, spreading the inferno even wider. The fire was not the white fire of a furnace, but red like blood. New blinding Christmas trees appeared in the sky, giving the signal to attack. Bombs and air torpedoes shrieked down on the city. Like an animal marked for slaughter, it lay there, and like lice, people searched for wrinkles and crannies to hide in. 
They were finished, torn to shreds, suffocated, burned, broken, minced. Yet many, just for a moment, made desperate attempts to save their lives. The lives to which they clung despite war, hunger, loss, and political terror. It's like, oh! Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, okay, we're in for something a, a little bit different here. That's, I think that's a gentle introduction to what happens over the next chapter. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's easing us in gently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. really is. Uh, yeah, I mean, just the re- re- rereading bits of it today before we met, because I read this a week, to, a week or two ago, and it reminds me of talks about the people who've turned up at embassies after suicide bombings and what he describes next, it, 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 just the, what, it, what it does to people's bodies... The, the people in the last throes of existence, mm. what they have to do to shoot people who are on fire, mm. you know, finding new craters of the, the survivors that have fallen into the craters in various states of disrepair yep. without without shocking people with what's in the book. Because, I mean, it just we could just sit here just going through the horrors of what he describes in the, of, of the aftermath of the fire. Yeah. And, and things that other, other survivors have, have, have seen through trauma, you know, opening up, a, opening up an air ridge of 52 dead bodies on the knees because yeah. they've asphyxiated. Yeah, that's, that's a of, really vivid image. That's a really vivid image. So is so is bathfuls of affluent of, of black fat of people yeah. that they've just scraped out of somewhere because they have to account for how many people. And well, that's fifty people in that bath. Yeah, that it's it's just I can't believe that. He, well, I can understand why it's sold, hmm. and I can understand what he's. It just sounds like the outpouring of a traumatized man. Parts of it. Hmm. That we can maybe discuss some of what some of the scandals that were maybe thrown about about him and the authenticity of some of his writing. But he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, later on, but you know, it, it, these are, this is a, a fictional account, but quite clearly. Yeah. Real accounts and eyewitness accounts of horrendous things that only people in these circumstances can have witnessed. Yeah. Uh, and it's... it's oh dear. There's, there's oh. something else interesting there at the end of that pa- last paragraph, though, which instantly marks this out as, um, as, as something a little bit different and actually something that makes you want to investigate his take on the war a little bit more. Because the last line is, the lives to which they clung despite war, hunger, loss and, yeah. po- and political terror... Yeah. So he's, he's instantly marking out the fact that his opinion of Germany in 1943 was of a, of a people who were really suffering not just from bombs but from the political terrorization of 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 their own government and and the Nazi party and we get plenty more references as the book goes on to his feelings about the German state and the Nazis and the role that they were forced to play in certain atrocities but that's that's your first real sign that he's talking about the political terror that these people are subject to before the burn to death by an RAF raid in the middle of the night. Yeah, it, well, it, it, well, the opening um, before the first chapter, the opening, the opening paragraph is you know the, the, our, the defense of these people is these men armed with rifles, which is quickly turned on them afterwards. Yeah, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, they talk about the mercy shootings they do of the people on fire, but there'll also be been people being rounded up for not following, you know, not following what the public orders are as regards managing the air raid or trying to flee when they're not allowed to flee. The mass shootings, the, the you know the, the arbitrary justice that will be dispensed out by the police in these kind of chaotic cities. Going back to Moorcock, he catches some of that in his, in his in his writings and when he's describing some of the horrific kind of wars between the various factions. Mm. You know, he, he doesn't hold back in any of that, does he? Some of the things you've described in your previous episodes. He, he doesn't, but he, he keeps it um, he keeps it very simple and stark. Mm. And and whilst we can laud Moorcock for writing great action. What you don't lose is um, the actual price and cost of it all. No. You know. Whereas this makes it a little bit more personal. Some of the actual descriptions of the individuals and the yeah. I'm, I'm going to read one, one more little bit um, after after we get the first occasion of of Porter announcing himself by saying Joseph Porter, Corporal by the grace of God, butcher in Adolf's army, habitual criminal and death candidate, corpse carrier and incendiary, your servant, gentlemen, mm-hmm. and that's that's a little bit of classic Joseph Porter very, very early in the book. But it goes on to say, For three solid hours, without a minute's peace, the explosives drummed down from the dark velvet sky. The phosphorus containers poured on the streets and houses in close-knit showers, in one impenetrable hailstorm of death and destruction. The flak had long since been silenced. Our night fighters were up there, but the big bombers were not bothered by their smaller brothers in hell. The huge steamroller of fire crushed the city from north to south, from east to west. The railway station was a roaring ruin of flames with red-hot carriages and engines in one molten heap as if it had been ground by a giant amusing himself. Hospitals and nursing homes collapsed in a holocaust of mortar and fire. Hence, here the many beds provided excellent opportunities for the phosphorus to sport. 
Most of the patients were in the cellars, but there were many left in the wards for the flames to devour. Screaming, amputated cases struggled to get up and away from the flames, which licked hot and hungry mm. through doors and windows. The long corridors provided chimneys with a splendid draught. Fireproof walls burst like glass under the devastating pressure of explosives. People got up only to fall gasping to the ground, suffocated by the heat. The stench of singed flesh and fat floated across to us in our trenches. Between the detonations, the last half-strangled screams reached us. It's really genuinely horrifying stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and and it, I think there's a passage later where he describes people jumping out of windows to get away from the fire. Yeah. You know, as a, as a re- recent cultural event, you know, the, the twin... I mean, you, you're describing what went on in the Twin Towers, aren't you? If, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. If, 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 you know, any... We'll talk, I'm no doubt, later about the horrors of the of, of what went on in the Eastern Front, but the horror that opening chapter for me is as horrible as anything else. Yeah, that happens. Um, and, and the description for, of for the remainder of the chapter, um, just after that, the re- a, a traumatized old police officer who who mm. should be retired but has been pressed back into service because all the younger men are at war, finds them and says that there's a children's home and all the children are trapped in the cellar. And that this this burned itself into my brain as a 13, 14-year-old. And I remember watching... Uh, so I read this round about the same time, or maybe a year before Threads was on TV. So, oh, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I slept for maybe three yeah. years after watching Threads. So is, is, is there any wonder, you know, people of our age might be a little bit, <laughs> I don't know, depressed or cynical or nihilistic or anything like that? But, uh, we're, li- we're living it second hand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, that's right. Um, <laughs> it's bad enough. So we, we get this scene where they're trying to relieve trapped children and women from a cellar. And it's it's a couple of really harrowing pages where they describe creating a hole and the children are pushing the hands through and they have to break the children's hands with spades to get them to withdraw the hands so they can continue to dig. And it, it goes on for quite a while and, and seasoned soldiers are, are breaking down and, and the, the police officer, is the old policeman, is on the verge of insanity. And eventually, when they get through to it, they manage to save, like, I don't know, a quarter of the children and the rest of them are all suffocated. And it's it's really genuinely harrowing stuff. Yeah, we we remember, the, we're going back to our own family's experiences, you know, the, the, the two men that said, but then there was two women that sat through, sat in hull th- through all of that. Yeah. All of the worst of it. And yeah. it, it certainly... Uh... And, and for people that don't know, um, Hull was one of the most bombed cities in England during the war. The Northern City, never mm. referred to in name. No, but yeah, yeah. No. The last, the last, the last lights on the way back for the German bombers, back yeah, to their air bases. So they just used to drop whatever. So, else so they if they had left. anything left, they dropped it on all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So that they would come, drop it all on the docks. And um, you remember when we trained at Delapol? Mm-hmm. So just for everybody's um, benefit, Robbo and I trained at one of the old psychiatric hospitals before they were closed in the early nineties. A hospital in just outside Hull called Delapol Hospital. And I remember doing a placement on one of the wards for um, which had all the old folks that had been there a long, 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 long time. Mm. And there was one guy, I'll never forget, Peter, and he was telling me about... He, he, he remembered being there as a, a, te- a teenager when and watching the German bombers go over, th- over the top because they used... You remember the old um, massive concrete chimney at Delapol? Yes, yeah, yeah. The German bombers that bombed the docks used it as a turning point. So they used it as a landmark for turning. So they would come in over the docks, drop all the payload on the docks, use that as a turning point, then drop any of the rest of the payload on the city before, before heading back out over the North Sea. And and it's it's funny, you know, there's there's barely anybody left who has those memories now. Mm. You know, so so those things kind of stick with you, don't they? Yeah, yeah, and that's why I was that's why I was happy to do this because I think you know, again, talking about our grandparents, we we've had it first hand. Mm. First hand, those first hand discussions with them, and other people will have that privilege of that experience, I think, mm. or, or or that knowledge to understand because it gets lost yeah. and it repeats itself. Yeah, and I think that's what that, that goes back to Moorcock. Is that's what, what, what Moorcock drives about is you know, it's some of the things you picked up about, and some of the interviews I've seen him in when he said about, um, you know, I got I, I got fascinated by by the Holocaust. What, what on earth was that about? Yeah. You know, and how how has that come to how has that come about? And you picked up in one of the reviews of his book that this one of the eternal champions is committing genocide. Yeah. The hero of the book. Yeah. You know, and he makes it very clear that this, like like with with Trump, is a good cultural reference. There's glamour to it. There's glamour that attracts people to this. Yeah. You know, the, the Nazis were well dressed. 
They had good cars and good tr- good trains, plenty of money, good wine. There was an attraction to it. Yeah. And, and going back to what you said about the right, you know, the, the, the loss of faith in the political system that he... Exp- I think that's with hindsight after it started. Mm. That, that They're all expressing that now, you know, three years into this grind, hang on. This is horrendous. What, mm. what have we been? What have we been conned into? Mm. But they all, you know, the, the author, according to the author's history, he was happy to sign up and join the mm. the romanticism of the army back in 1937. Mm. You know, and then when the re- reality of it hit, and this is what I've, I've experienced as well, speaking with with veterans of the recent recent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, they quickly went, well, "What? Are, what is this all about? Mm. This isn't quite what Tony had in mind when he said, "Well, you know, we'll go in." change government and everything will be all right because that's that's exactly how wars work isn't it you Mm. go into a country change a government and everybody goes oh well thanks for doing that we'll all move on thanks for carpet bombing everywhere as as he beautifully describes in this well beautifully if that's the wrong word i think horrifically describes about what that is about and the aftermath of what that means to the people who've been through it the consequences of that go on for generations well there's a brilliant quote from cross of iron the movie which i'll probably get wrong now James Coburn is sitting with um, one of his men, and is and is they're having this philosophical conversation because, of course, that's that's the worst thing about Cross of Iron is it's extreme violence, Eastern Front war movie with occasional bursts of philosophy, and uh, yeah, and um, his guy with a awesome tash turns around to him and says, "Von Clausewitz said that war is state policy by other means." <laughs> I've probably got that wrong. I've probably got that wrong, but um, yeah, it's it's just a brilliant quote. And to be honest, if 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 anybody out there isn't really in the mood to read any Sven Hassel, but wants to watch a film which gets anywhere near to it, Cross of Iron is your best part of call. Yeah. Which incidentally was based on a novel by um, another ex serviceman who served in World War Two called Willie Heinrich. Um, it was originally called The Willing Flesh. I think he wrote three books. The Willing Flesh, which became, which was retitled Cross of Iron after the film came out. The Savage Mountain and another one. And they're all fucking excellent as well. All of, and Stein is the main character in all three. Absolutely brilliant. I've only read two of them. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you, you, were, you were talking about how this was such a big, big seller in England. I mean, the Germans, there must have been literature out in Germany that was coming out in its droves because the experience of the German nation of... of through the whole backlash from the Eastern Front and as it came back to Berlin, yeah. must have been horrendous. And there must have been, you know, it, it must have been common knowledge to the mm. Germans about a lot of what was going on, you know, family talk and experiences of the people coming back, sharing all of these horrors with each and, and living through them. Yeah. You know, living through the, the blitz from the British and the Americans, the on the onrushing Russian army. You read about some of the modern historians writing about the downfall of Berlin and the last 10 or 15 years where they've actually got, you know, bothered to go through the records and give mm. the German experience of what they went through. Well, that's why Anthony Beaver made yeah. probably a hell of a lot of money by, you know, with, with yeah. that, 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 that Berlin downfall book was yeah. mind blowing at the time. Yeah. It was absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Brilliant. you because you get you actually live the experience of it. It, it, it. it for us, it was this kind of oh, fantastic event of where we caught we caught this man in his bunker, and and pinned him down and you know defeated the the Reich. Yeah. There was a consequence to that, which was you know, six out of seven German casualties were on the Eastern Front. Yeah. Six out of seven. Yeah, it, it, millions upon millions of people and more civilians than soldiers. Yeah, I think it was it's one of the first wars where there's been more civilians than military casualties. What mm. fact? Mm-hmm. Certainly, one of the first wars in the last few centuries. Yeah. So, if chapter one, if, if chapter one ain't bad enough, um, <laughs> no. chapter two, if anything, is worse. And yes. and, and you, you've already mentioned a couple of the bits, and we won't go into any detail, and I won't read any of those bits out. But essentially, chapter two is the aftermath, where next day they're having to clean up the mess. As you say, the references to it's it's the, they're not picking up bodies so much as scooping remains up. And shoveling them up and shoveling it out of cellars, um, and there's the the, the bathtub thing yeah. where because the Prussian army rules are that all body parts and all people from a same household must be buried together, they end up with this situation where they've got a bath of bathtub full of remains that the count as fifty two people, so it can be buried together, and it's it's uh, it's appalling, but it's kind of littered by that like black humour of the bit where the the guy's arm comes off and and Porter makes his joke and. And the Sven Hassel, the the author, the narrator, is talking about how um, the 
gallows humour and the charnel house humour and the black humour that they all have between themselves is the only thing, apart from the cheap schnapps, yes. that, that can enable them to actually function and get through it without completely losing it and, and stopping functioning. So that's another really, really fascinating thing about this book, is in the first two chapters you've got descriptions of British air raids which cause untold damage on women, children, men, old, young, hospitals. And then you've got essentially acknowledgement at every stage of the trauma yes. that it causes on soldiers, on the police, on all these different people. And it's and there's no hiding from it. There's no shirking from it. But it's it's not even sensationalised. It's so casual in its, in its um, description and so factual that it feels authentic. And it's some of the most authentic descriptions of trauma and the circumstances that lead to trauma that I think, uh, well, I'd, obviously I'd never read anything like it when I read it at the time, but I still don't think I've, I've read anything like it since. And and even then, it's written in such a gripping, page-turning manner that I mean, when, when Sven Hassel died and I did the um, the obituary for the choirs, I pulled down a copy of, uh, my, my granddad's co- popped his copy of Wheels of Terror off the shelf and took a photograph of it and sent it to, along with the article. And because I pulled it off the shelf, I started reading it, and I got ten pages in, and then I just read it from cover to cover again, because it's just such a, you know, it's such a brilliant read. Yeah, it it reads like I, I agree with what you're saying. It, it it reads like the outpourings of a variety of events. Yeah, that this person or people close to him or people he's been with have witnessed through this long period of warfare and all of the consequences of it. And, and they're by people who've seen it. They're the yeah. outpourings of trauma victims. It's, see, see, it feels like you're in a group full yeah. of veterans and they're just outpouring. For, we had to do this, we saw this, we had to do that. That's what it feels like. And it's got, the, it's got the realism of that. And then it feels like it's gone a little bit through a publishing house's rewriter, you know, to try and make it into a manageable story, in, you know, that kind of element to it as well. But it, it, the, the, the genuineness of, the, of, the, of what they've seen and the, and the honesty about it, there's no glorifying of it, especially in these early chapters, particularly when he's dealing with the bombings. Mm. There's, there's, it's, it's very real and it's very real, the physical and emotional consequences for everybody. Mm. Yeah. There's other bits later on in the book that, that, that are yeah. just yeah, similar. I, 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 we probably won't get to the Eastern Front sections on this episode, but we'll, we'll, we'll revisit it a little bit further down the line and do, mm. and do a part two. But what one of the other things he's really really good at is the is the levity, and and I think as as an is quite a skilled author in that he understands if you're going to put something this grim in, you've got to put some levity in, and the levity tends to come from the characters. And the third chapter, a shot in the night, we get an introduction to first of all the training facility of Senelaga, which also happens to be a place where people are executed. <laughs> oh. But we meet we meet Colonel is it Colonel von Weissenhagen, <laughs> who's like the the brutal head of training at this at this place, and we get quite a fa- quite a few nice little. And this is where you get a lot with Sven Hassel novels is these first couple of chapters, and actually probably this book and maybe the two following it all do roughly follow on from each other. So if you've read Wheels of Terror, you can then read Comrades of War and it feels like a continuation. And then you can read March Battalion and it feels like a continuation. The beginning of that relates somewhat to the end of the last book. But after that, it just becomes vignettes. It just becomes a series of vignettes. And Mm. because he's, he's selling so many books, these characters end up at Monte Cassino. They end up fighting in Normandy, you know, and, and basically they end up like, um, Martin Platt in Coronation Street. If anybody goes (laughs) to the hospital, Martin Platt's the nurse on that ward. That's, that's what these characters end up being like for World War II for the German army. If the German army were there, they're there. I think the only, the only theater of war that there isn't a book about them fighting in is probably North Africa. Well, at some point it becomes, I mean, it must become a money-making exercise. The, bit, the bits I read about how we got to write in these things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 what fits as well is uh, very much so is a lot of people who've been through these things don't want to talk about them because they're mm. horrific. Now, the, the, the narrative is, and it does fit, that his wife pushed him to write. Yeah. You know, after he got out of the prisoner of war, after he got out of jail in 50 or whatever it was, his wife says, you need to write all this. You need to write all this. And he, he wouldn't do it. And... 
he wrote a, he wrote a narrative of it and then it got rewritten by the, the the first book and then it got rewritten by the publishing house you know and dressed up probably these characters were given a little bit of an embellishment etc cetera, etc cetera. but it, it reads like it reads like the memoirs of somebody who's been through a lot of these and mm. probably stories that he shared with other people serving soldiers that he's been through it's interesting that he's he's he's, he's reported that he's paralyzed for two years mm. from 1957 to just before the publishing of this book which would again fit with a trauma kind of picture of somebody mm. who's yeah. somatized all of this horror and distress yeah. and a very common response to a lot of people who've been i mean that we we, we we see people now who've been through one two three four five traumas yeah this was a daily experience for these people their brains were just yeah. reset to a different level yeah well w- wheels of terror itself is it's, it's an embellishment on what takes place in the legion of the damned because he wrote, wrote legion of the damned as his first novel which basically starts with him being tried as a deserter and finishes it with him I think getting a field commission and and everybody's dead. So the old man's dead, Porter's dead. It's much longer since I read Legion of the Damned. So it's like he wrote Legion of the Damned. It was successful. He's gone away and he's, in many ways, he's done a Moorcock before Moorcock, which is what Moorcock <laughs> did with Elric. He wrote the end of the saga in the late 60s and then thought, hang on a minute, there's, there's, there's more stories to be told here and it's a bit of a seller. I'm now going to go back and write a, a million novels set between the beginning and the end. And and he did that. He did that a hell of a lot. I mean, it does get a little bit silly. The last novel, The Commissar, is basically a, re, a retelling of Kelly's Heroes, but from <laughs> but from a from a German perspective. The last couple of novels, they end up with a, a colonial African tank driver called Albert. Um, so new, yeah, new new characters, and that's that's a little bit dodgy because there are references to them only being able to see a smile at night. When, oh, when, yeah, right. when he's driving, so yeah. you know it does it does get a little bit distasteful in some ways. But it's basically writing adventure novels by that point. It's, it's the, the literacy industry. Yeah, and Marcock Marcock's quite candid about it, isn't he? He was oh, yeah. involved in it before he be, even started writing. He, he understood it really well. And it's just, this is a big part of this with this guy. You're not you're not you're not reading Anthony Beauvoir or Siegfried Sassoon. You know, you're reading you're reading the fictional account of quite obviously eyewitness you know mm. real events that he's seen yeah. put together into a story it, but he's got a feeling for it Andy like you've picked up on you know that he, we need to you know this isn't what we should be doing to each yeah, other yeah. this needs to stop so there is a sense of real mystery around him there's almost like a narcotic quality to the mystery surrounding Sven Hassel because of course that Danish journalist pursued him with almost <laughs> a, a, a vendetta to try and expose him as as a fraud, but later on, that Danish journalist himself ended up being outed as an appalling Holocaust denier. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I read that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you know whether the amount to which this is based on his own personal experience is like a sliding scale, depending on what book you read, depending on what who you yeah. on who you talk to. I remember recommending um, Wheels of Terror or one of the books to Magic Paul, and you remember Magic Paul. Yeah, and uh, whose whose dad was at Nagasaki? Whose dad was because. his dad was um, a POW working yeah. in a mine, yeah. and had he been on the other side of the mountain range, he would have been killed yeah. by the Nagasaki atomic bomb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I lent I lent it to Magic Paul, and and this is one of the things that you tend to get now. Now Paul was, and I'm going to offend some members of the listenership here. I'm sure Paul was a war gamer, and Paul was one of these military hardware nerd war gamers. Who said, well, you know, in, yeah. in between a sip of his dark orange tea and a tug on his rolly, <laughs> he said, uh, said, well, I, d- I don't really buy it, to be honest, because, um, it, you know, it, it says at one point they've got 76 armour-piercing high-explosive shells in the turret of the uh, of the Panzer IV, which is completely ridiculous and not at all accurate. Uh, so, oh, God. The 27th Wet Savvy in <laughs> yeah, May right. 1943. I think yeah. you'll find they yeah. were on the Greece front. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think you'll find that Panzer Force went went deployed in uh, in Carpathia at that time in 1942. Well, this is a fascinating thing that we, I have at work all the time with with traumatized people who, who come with trauma because they 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 don't. I mean, they, this is separate from you know Sven's Assel's books, like you say, it's a sliding scale of yeah. all sorts of different influences, but also to, to people to accurately recall what's gone on yeah. when they're shoveling up the fried fat of human beings. Oh, yeah. it was on Thursday, three o'clock, I think. Between three and three thirty, I think we were shoveling, shoveling yeah. human fat. 
Yeah. Three forty and three forty six. There was a further bombing a yeah. bombing raid. Well, these accounts don't tally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We broke for tea at yeah. three fifty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, do- it doesn't work. Your brain doesn't work like that, and it doesn't recall things like that. That's why yeah. it's such a hor- horrors for them for decades and no. decades. And also, these books have been translated. You know, mm. so it's <laughs> like it's, it's the same as saying, well, at one point, he tells someone to shut the gob. Germans <laughs> didn't. Germans didn't say gob. <laughs> Yeah, but and also, do, do, do you seriously? If you if you served in the Wehrmacht, do you actually write down what you did and where you were when you? No. There could be some consequences. Yeah, there might be some angry people up the road who uh, might be wanting some retribution. You're yeah. seeing people, you know, lock. It's it, it's what it is. But it, it's yeah. like you say, it's hair curlingly. Yeah, and and unforgiving. Yeah, those those. So you, you've got that intoxicating blend here of of stuff that is genuinely horrifying, yet has the stink of reality. Men, women, and children were bombed, you know, in Dresden, in Berlin, everywhere. So having those vivid descriptions, there's nothing dishonest about it. Is the description of be, in being there? Well, you know, th- mm. this is a novel. It's not uh, a documentary account. But what it does do, and what it did have in in huge amounts, was evident knowledge. And whether that's first-hand knowledge or a combination of first-hand knowledge and you know, testimony and account from people he knew or from comrades, and he does apparently have a service record of of being oh, yeah. of, of serving, oh, yeah. but also with a terrifically dark sense of humour and also a, a really an unparalleled ability to be absolutely brutally frank and plain about these things in a way that I don't think anybody else did for decades afterwards, and. The third thing is, he's a fucking terrific writer. You know, for, for this is genre fiction at the end of the day. It's not Solzhenitsyn or like that. No, it's, no. it's it's genre fiction, and he was a fucking great genre writer. And so many authors tried to copy him and clone him. Some really terrible ones. The worst probably being Leo Kessler, aka Charles Whiting, the British historian. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, and, and and actually, funnily enough. The Leo Kessler novels, I think, are fucking awful. Um, and they also really kind of glorify the SS and various other bits and pieces. And they kind of glorify the the German war experience. It's almost like he was he was he wanted to write Sven Hassel novels, but 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 get rid of all the left wing political bias. <laughs> there is there is no glory in these books. Yeah. Other other so, than what I feel, a couple of ham, you know later on a few yeah. kind of ham fisted descriptions of hand to hand fighting. Yeah. There is no glorification in any of this. No. It's, what, what I would say though is Charles Whiting's novels as Leo. Kessler or garbage, but his actual historical novels, sorry, not not novels, his historical history books are really good. <laughs> I yeah. wish it stuck to them because yeah. he, he did one called The Battle of the Hurkan Forest, which is one of the, one of the best kind of World War Two history books I ever read, uh, because it's it's a compulsive page turner. He writes it like he's a novelist, yeah. um, and, and his fact based stuff is really good. But his his um, his wild kind of observations about the German war machine and 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 his 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 temptation to um, to, to remove any kind of criticism of the German state is a bit a bit dodgy. But there is some really hilarious stuff in the Battle of Hergen Forest, but where he slags off Ernest Hemingway, he goes he goes off on a massive rant about what a prick Hemingway was, <laughs> which which has always stuck Tash. with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, he, he talks about Hemingway being um, after, after the invasion of Normandy, he was he was always kind of there or thereabouts, but always behind the lines and basically just topping sensible it, place for a journalist, <laughs> topping it up with 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 um, American officers and smoking cigars and and drinking brandy and and just yeah. generally. Be, being his larger than life, I am Hemingway kind of guy. Yeah, it's really funny. Whiting thinks he's a massive prick and, and he's, he's not afraid to say so. <laughs> it's a long time since I read it though. It's a ha- harsh man to target. He had plenty of other people. He had plenty of other people at the time he could have criticised. Yeah, but, but he picks. But he picks Hemingway. He goes after Hemingway in a big way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, back to Will's terror. So we get. Um, they're back in barracks now training with new tanks so the air raid is over everything's over and uh says the soldiers said that senelager had been created by god in his ugliest mood personally i thought there was something in that it's equal for uncomfortable terrain with sand and bog thick bush and impenetrable thorns would be hard to find it was surely more desolate and depressing than the gobi desert it had been cursed by the thousands who had trained on it in the kaiser's time and who were later to fall in the 1914-18 war 
the volunteers in the 100,000 strong Reichwehr, who had chosen the soldier's trade to escape from unemployment, came to long for the grey hopelessness of civilian unemployment, rather than face daily the hell that was Senelager. We, the Third Reich's soldier slaves, got it tougher than any of them, and the legendary Unteroffizier Himmelstoss in the Kaiser's time had nothing on our officers and NCOs when it came to the routine of military sadism. He was only a baby. Many people condemned to death by court-martial in the Rhine-Westphalen command were executed here, but as the old one once put it, when you were brought here to die, death must be a blessed release, if only to escape looking at the incredibly depressing, soul-destroying stretch of country that was Senelaga. So, I don't know, whereas it's probably, I don't know, maybe it's like um, that stretch outside Withensee or something. <laughs> <laughs> Patrington to Withensee. <laughs> Patrington to Withensee, yeah. Yeah, really, really, really depressing and flat. <laughs> Yeah, but we get um, we get some kind of nice little uh, vignettes now about um, Sven and Pluto on guard duty, and we get a description of uh, of, of Weissenhagen, the uh, the commanding officer. But we also get some of these uh, some of these w- <laughs> some of these wonderful little things. There's a, a description of Porter, and this is why I love the translation. And whoever's translated this is a genius. Porter fairly danced past us, laughing his head off. We could count the last three teeth in his huge gob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got to go through. My I don't sp- know what the Danish is for gob. <laughs> yeah, I've got to go through my Sven Assel books at some point and and kind of list all the ones done by specific translators because um, there's a variety of different translators who did the who did the editions that end up getting published in English. And weirdly, some of them are in the present tense, which is quite bizarre when you pick one up for the first time. Yeah, yeah, it's quite weird. I, I, yeah, the translators make a huge difference. I've read, I've read some books translated from Russians, and the, the, the different translations are hu- make a huge different experience yeah. reading them. So um, Porter and some of the others get to go into town, whoring probably. Um, I think we'll probably find that out yeah. later on. Going, and going down the pub and whoring. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, Pluto and Sven have to, uh, after they ate their nettle soup, have to go on guard duty. Uh, so they're on gadget, but before, that, before they go out, they uh, they have to um, buddy up to Sergeant Major Poust a little bit and and, and win him over. So they get him some grot mags. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're taking some grot mags. So basically, they're they're um, they're getting to spend some time inside, but they have to bribe um, Poust with some grot mags, um, which. <laughs> <laughs> which part has lent them. It says, Dully, we sat in the guard room and played pontoon, but were soon fed up and packed it up. We threw ourselves back into high-backed guard room chairs. Here we sat mooning over some strongly pornographic magazines which Porter had lent us. What a fanny she's got! Pluto <laughs> grinned and pointed, just... pointed to a girl in my magazine. It's translated by a Dane who spent <laughs> five years in the East End. <laughs> Where did you learn your English? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Down the fish market. Yeah. So uh, anyway, S- Sergeant Reinhardt comes over and he's like, "Oh, you got some grot mags." Sergeant Sergeant Reinhardt's a bit of a bit, bit of a dick, yeah, and uh, a bit of a creep. But he's he's the um, he's like the guard barracks sergeant, and he he wants a piece of these grot mags. So Pluto says, "Well, you know what? You can have some grot mags if you get us some opium fags." And he uses the expression "fags" as well. Yeah. Get us some opium yeah. fags. I, I, I love it. I love it. So um, Pluto manages to actually um, convince Sergeant Reinhardt. Um, to get him some opium fags, and he'll give him some of these uh, some of these jazz mags. And uh, there's also another great bit where it says, uh, "I don't understand why you stick around here when you ate it so much." Said Pluto, blowing his nose in the old-fashioned way and flicking some of the snot on Reinhardt's chair. <laughs> 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 anyway, but we, we we need to we need to get to the point. So they're on guard duty, and they've got to go out and do the patrol. And Colonel Weishagen is is a bit of a hard case, and there's a really nice description of him. Our officers took a peculiar pleasure in wandering about just to make sure the sentries were alert enough to challenge them. Colonel von Weishagen, our commandant, had a special passion for this form of sport. He was a very small man with a much too big monocle screwed into his face. His uniform was a study in the fancy dress of a Prussian officer, green tunic in a half Hungarian, half German cut, very short like a cavalryman's, light grey breeches, almost white with the hide of a cow sewn to the seat. Typical cavalry style, black, very long patent leather boots. It was a riddle to us how he managed to bend his legs when he wore them. Because of the breeches and the boots, he was nicknamed Backside and Boots by the soldiers. His cap was high in front, of the kind particularly favoured by the Nazi bosses, and heavily embroidered with eagle and wreath, and a chin strap fashioned from an enormously heavily knotted silver cord. 
Naturally, his greatcoat was of the long black leather kind, with those dashing broad lapels. Around his neck dangled a poor Lemerite. That was his decoration from the First World War, when he had served in one of the Kaiser's horse guard regiments. He still wore the old cavalry insignia quite improperly on the shoulder tabs of his Nazi uniform. The soldiers laid bets between themselves if the mannequin had any lips. His mouth was a thin line which literally disappeared in his hard-lined face, made unsightly by a duelling scar. His ice-cold blue eyes dominated the brutal face. When you were up in front of the little commandant, you became cold with fright as he addressed you in velvet tones while his cold, unfeeling eyes sucked your stomach out. They were a cobra's eyes. Oberst Leutnant von Weishagen's eyes, commandant of the 27th Penal Panzer Regiment's depot. Nobody could remember ever having seen a woman in von Weishagen's company, and small wonder. Any woman in his presence would have become stiff as a board when his eyes pierced her. When he was thrown out of the army at the end of the war, he was a certainty for a governorship of an institution for particularly difficult prisoners. The man simply did not exist, it seemed, who he could not destroy or shape at will. One other spectacular thing about this man, he always carried his holster unbuttoned, the more easily to reach the evil shining black-blue Mauser. His Batman, he had two, said he also carried a Walther 7.65 with all six bullets filed down to dum-dum heads. His riding whip hollowed hid a thin, long sword stick. He would whip it out in a flash from its beautifully plaited leather covering. He knew he was hated and feared, and had taken precautions against any persecuted wretch who might become desperate and light-headed enough to attack him. Naturally, he was never sent to the front. His connections in high places saw to that. His red-haired mongrel, Baron, was a complete fairy tale in himself. The dog was included in the army list of the nominal role of the depot, and several times was degraded in front of the whole battalion. The adjutant, as proper in such circumstances, read out the punishment in the orders of the day. Somehow the dog never rose above the rank of corporal. At the moment he was a lance corporal and locked in a cell as a penalty for dropping excrement under his master's desk. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, if you're going to set out to create a villainous officer, that's your archetype, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's a reasonable first, first draft. Yeah. First go at it. Yeah, yeah. That, that is completely your archetype. And of course, they, they do have a little bit of fun and they get Reinhardt into a little bit of bother because when they're out and about, they get jumped by Weishagen and this, Pluto says, show us your papers. And Weishagen says, no, and pulls a gun on them. <laughs> so Pluto shoots his hat off. <laughs> and, and they take him to the guardhouse, uh, where Reinhardt fo- essentially falls to his knees like a blubbering mess. So von Weishagen, being von Weishagen, says, Reinhardt, you're a disgrace, you're under arrest, you're off to the Eastern <laughs> Front. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure that little vignette has been repeated in some other stuff oh. or some other film, and it's it's almost like a cliched scene. Of 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 you know the, the 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 rebellious rogue soldiers and the and the evil officer showing them some kind of respect because they do what he expects yeah. soldiers to do, and 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 I have seen it in one movie. And this and this is where we hit um, Lord Shark's ostentatious couch for the first time <laughs> with Wheels of Terror, because there is actually a film of Wheels of Terror. Oof. Believe it or not, yeah, it's a, it was it was a straight to video film. Made probably in the late eighties. Uh, late eighties, straight to video. Yeah, it was, <laughs> and um, it was in the states. It was called the Misfit Brigade, and who played von Weishagen? Oof. Von Weishagen. Now that's a good question. That's um... so American actor doing straight to video films. Who would probably do anything for a couple of bottle of vodkas and five five hundred dollars? I'd love to say George Peppard. <laughs> <laughs> it should have been. It should have been. David um... Carradine. <laughs> David Carradine plays von Weishagen in the movie, and that and that scene is in the movie, <laughs> almost word for word. Oh wow! Yeah, and David Carradine. Yeah, David oh, Carradine. Man. Yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now the movie, <laughs> if you're a Sp- so- if if you're a Sven Hassel fan, is is worth a look. And it, is, it, is, it does pop up occasionally available on DVD. Me being a complete nerd, I've got a VHS copy of it kicking around somewhere, an ex-rental one. But it's, it's got some really interesting casting. It's, it's, the, the cast is slimmed down quite substantially, so there's no Hugo Stage, there's no Muller, there's But you've got the old man. We haven't got to the Legionnaire yet, or Tiny, because we'll yeah. get to them in a, cha- in, in a couple of chapters. And, uh, but you've got Porter, who doesn't look anything like he does in the books. He's too good-looking. 
and the story overall um i think it starts with the air raid scene but it's it's pretty lame by comparison naturally i don't think i've seen anything on film that would capture that no but, but i mean even then doing doing something like yeah. that on a straight to video budget you're either, not going to do it just yeah. as a but um, even even in today's time, I don't think I've, I've seen in any film yeah. the way they've portrayed that. But but it has the Senna Lager scene with von Weishagen. Most importantly, it has the Tiny and Legion air fight, which we'll get to shortly. Yeah. And then it kind of goes off on the got to go behind enemy lines to blow up a bridge. Uh, it goes whatever. straight into the air team, straight straight, yeah. straight from a bar fight to the air team. Yeah. To but, cabbage but, throwers. But and... interestingly, there's there's one other scene which is a staple of Sven Hassel novels, and the, it's got a brothel scene. Naturally. He's not. He's, yeah, he's not great on his female characters. No, he's, he's not. But I, I, I always did appreciate the fact that... And I, I can't remember whether this happens once or whether it happens in every book because my memory is so, <laughs> so messed up, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the archetypal brothel scene in a Sven Hassel book is the go to the brothel, the get drunk. There's no sex scenes, but the... The brothel runner and her evil pimp are so horrible that they end up either killing them or running them out of town and partying with the whores. <laughs> um, that might be in the later ones. I will say in this yeah. one, without 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 spoilers, the, he does admit that this is set up by the government. That this is a joy division. He's, he's got he's candid enough to say that you know the, the army set up a whorehouse for us yeah. with women with women from back home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, we'll get to that when we when yeah. we get to those bits and bobs. But I just I just had to mention David Carradine, and the uh, <laughs> and the Gordon Hessler directed Wheels of Terror. Gordon Hessler, I think, was best kn- best known for directing westerns in the sixties and seventies. I can and see then, the link there with David Carradine. Yeah, but... and then ends up directing this Wheels of Terror adaptation in the late eighties, filmed in Eastern Europe. But the most amazing thing is, you remember Cross of Iron? Yes. You remember the little blonde Russian lad who James Coburn takes under his wing? When he captures him, there's a, there's a yes. little Russian soldier, and he, and he takes him back to the barracks, and they basically use him as a domestic in the barracks. And then later on, there's an attack, and the Russian, this little blonde Russian lad, runs back towards his own lines and gets shot by his own men. Mm-hmm. The actor who played him plays Sven in Wheels of Terror. <laughs> yeah, Cra- crazy fact. Time. What's your spe- what's your speciality? Oh, anything on the Eastern Front? Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you anything. Yeah, <laughs> I blew my mind when I, when, when I watched it for the first time. I was like, hang on a minute, he looks familiar. I can give oh, yeah. you. De- I can do dead, and I can do terrified. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. <our> old man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely amazing. And uh, when we do part two, we'll go into a little bit more detail about some of the, some of the other casting um, for some of these roles, because actually, some of the actors who play every single actor who plays one of these roles, probably with the exception of the old man, is a well-known actor who, who any film buff will recognise. And some of them actually gone off to have very successful careers. I can imagine off the sales of the book, they might have had a bit of a budget when they started. Yeah. Um, but once they started re- re- rewriting it for the film. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do question whether, despite the fact that the Sven Hassel books probably in the 50s and 60s sold shitloads, I think as they went along, they probably sold less and less. And by the 80s, there was strictly the purview of of uh, men in their 60s or their grandsons. <laughs> 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 but but anyway, you know. So in fact, what we'll have to do is once lockdown's over, we'll have to have a grand watching, <laughs> do a DVD commentary. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do a special box set. Of it, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well, that's not what happens. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we've uh, we've we've had our our kind of slightly lighter chapter where we get. Grot mags and the entertainment of them condemning uh, a sergeant who's not a particularly pleasant fellow, but nevertheless probably doesn't deserve to go to prison and maybe get executed <laughs> or served to the, sent to the Eastern Front, but they've got some opium fags out of it, so that's all right. But then we get back to something quite harrowing and sensitively portrayed in Chapter 4, which is called State Murder. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I found that. Yeah, I found that very. Yeah, that was hard to read. That, that was yeah. well done. Yeah, and it is very well done. It is very well done, and they find that they've been five of them have been detailed to firing squad duty, mm. and they have to end, escort an old NCO and a young woman, a former telephone operator who was accused of spreading communist literature to the the firing squad posts and execute them. And it's 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 quite a long chapter, and it, and it is actually. Um, mm quite sombre in turn that the, the, the humor of the previous episode vanishes yeah, and it's God. and once again it's quite a stark but very well written description of of how cheap 
people's lives were and how easily people were executed and how the process worked and how regular yeah. soldiers were roped in to do it. They didn't have firing squad squads who did it all. They just they just grabbed a, a, a section of soldiers from nearby and they had to go and do it. They had to go and do the deed. Yeah. When it dawns on them, that's what they've got to do. That that's really well written. I thought the they, the, once they once they understand what they've been picked for, yeah, and get to the meet the people that they're going to have to do this to. That that's the only um, human, if that's the best description of it, the best personal kind of description of them. Because there's lots of descriptions of killing people yeah. later on in the book, but that's the one where it is actually some. You get introduced to the victims of the violence. That's right. And the difficulty that they're having having to do that, whereas in other parts of the book, they they, they lighten. Well, they they try and make light of what they've got to do in certain situations, but in this one, they really struggle with it. Yeah. And you can imagine, you know, just this isn't what armies are supposed. This isn't what's written on the on the label when you. Uh, sign up to do these things another nail in the coffin of all their ins- aspirations and understandings of what they thought they were going to be doing yeah and e- even pluto up until this point has has been something of a portrayed as something of a a, a, a callous brute you know agrees that he'll uh he'll, he'll take letters to the old nco's wife he'll he'll deliver a letter for the young woman it, it describes how that they become almost comradely and friendly with these people as they're escorting them to what they know is their is their final end, and then they try and look after them as best as possible before they basically shoot them dead. It's yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's pretty difficult. You, you even yeah. get you even get a description of uh, you, you know I mean, I'm not going to read out the stuff about how kind of traumatized the people are about to get shot at and how the, the knees go weak and and how they die and all that business, but you get um, a really kind of cold and stark description of the administration of it which makes it if anything feel more real the military prosecutor gave the papers to a major from the panzer grenadiers he did not manage to get all the different colored sheets in order at once the wind teased him in a falsetto voice he started reading out in the name of the fuhrer and the german people the specially convened military court under the commanding general of defense sector six has centred Armgard Bartels, born April 3rd, 1922, telephone operator in Defect Sector 6, serving in Bielefeld, to death by shooting. The prisoner is convicted of communication with an illegal communist organisation and the distribution of leaflets dangerous to the state to her colleagues in the exchange, as well as in the barracks where her section was billeted. Her confession in writing is witnessed by the prisoner. Court-martial counsellor Dr Yarn, Major General of the Police Schliermann and SA Gruppenführer Whitman acted as judges. The condemned prisoner is forever without honour and all her property falls to the state. The guard commander from the depot of the 27th Penal Panzer Regiment has been detailed to carry out the execution. Clerical duty will be performed by Chaplain Kurt Meyer. Staff Surgeon Dr Metgen will certify the execution completed. The military prosecutor, Dr. Weissman, GE, and training battalion 309 will see that the sentence is carried out according to regulations. The duty of notifying the prisoner's relatives lies with Standort Prison 66 Paderborn. The burial following the execution will be carried out by Sonder Command from Pioneer Battalion 57. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's so cold. The, the, the descriptions of, as I said, the descriptions of the characters, the traumatic experience, the feelings that they go through having to do this, their interactions with the people that they're about to shoot, is all kind of put in stark um, clarity by this absolutely cold administrative process. And, and the idea that, you know, their, um, their confessions were witnessed by uh, yeah. S.A. Gruppenfuhrer, Whitman and Obergruppenführer Dr. Hirsch and, and all these little details it's like doctors oh, yeah. Beca- yeah, became yeah. became Obergruppenführers in the SS you know this and, is this is how deeply ingrained it was and so lost in their ability you know their, their their duty to care for people that they'd become this is what they'd they'd found their niche in the system and what it does capture I think in a lot in a lot of aspects of the book like you say in the little details and the little bits Odd sometimes just throw away little paragraphs that maybe the guy who's helped rewrite it has lost, um, but obviously knew that they were important. That these were two institutions, the Soviet and the Nazi governments, that you know had very you know if you didn't do what we told you to do, they were so paranoid. If you went toe the land, then you were against us, so you would be you'd be exterminated. Yeah. If you don't go forward when we tell you to do, you'll be exterminated. If you don't do that, 
you're dead. Yeah. And if there's any doubt about you, so, and, and they were also very, very good at keeping records about it mm. because they thought they, they had no problems in keep. So people could, people would tell these individual stories, but then they'd go back through the government records and go, all these papers would be there. Yeah. Of these events that had happened, and I think in the after the after the Soviet Empire fell, you know the historians have got as, uh, access to their records, mm. and that's reinforcing what went on. A lot of what he describes later, which we'll come to, is reinforced by the historical records of the Soviet mm. government and various other eyewitness accounts of what went on at the time. Yeah, and and, and that that cold kind of writing is very different from some of the other. Like you say, it, it does um, contrast brilliantly from the previous chapter of. Which which is typical kind of horseplay of men in their twenties <laughs> trying to trying to make trying to survive and make sense of what they're in trying to make light trying to find light in horrible darkness. Yeah. So they get back after this horrific action that they've had to take. When they get back, Merle says it's twenty past twelve. How time flies. And Schwartz, who sounds like a real wanker, says uh, we've had the peas. So while they've been gone. Schwartz has had the peas. <laughs> is, is, is he a wanker or yeah. did he just not know what they were doing? No, he knew exactly what they were doing. Because when, <laughs> they're, on, when they're on the way out, he <laughs> says, we're getting peas later. And of course, oh, you know, right. peas, peas, vitamins, yeah. you yeah. know. So they get back That's... and, you rotten animal, howled stage and went for the un- unsuspecting Schwartz. I'll knock your bloody teeth in. Then you won't manage to wolf peas again for bloody weeks. He sat on top of Schwartz, who had gone down with a crash. He bashed him in one in the face with one fist while he tried to strangle him with the other. Schwartz was nearly dead when we at last got stage away. He was frothing at the mouth and had to be held down by Pluto and Bauer. Through the din, we heard Pal shout, "For God's sake, cut out that row!" It's 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 just brutal and and matter of fact and 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 every time you know you you could take that as if you just saw that scene in isolation without the context of what went beforehand, it would it would be funny. But this is how kind of bleak. <laughs> this is how bleak it all is. When you see it with the context, Paust has just driven him there. He hadn't done the shooting, but he's the sergeant major, so he's driven him there. They've shot an old man and a girl. They've gone back. Schwartz has said, "I've eaten your peas." Sturge has nearly killed him, and all Paust is bothered about is keep the noise down. Yeah. It's it's it's. Uh... So sometimes when you read stuff for the podcast, you read it and you look for something to talk about. So you so you notice a little bit more. And, and and stuff like this is is the strength of it because it's it's real casual and it's real throwaway, but it's it adds so much depth and weight to how kind of burnt out they are, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. There's and there's lots and lots of those later on in the book, yeah. more, more and more so. And obviously, it'll come to me because I've read it more recently than last stages of the book. But yeah, yeah there's there's constantly those. You'll get halfway down a page and there's a line you think, okay, yeah. So then then we get another fairly light chapter with uh, a little bit of levity, and the chapter's called Porter as Pope. And and this it actually signals something that will happen a lot in the other books, which is you will get an entire chapter which will be entirely dedicated to a Porter sh- tall story. Yeah. Or sometimes it'll be a Porter recipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's one of them yeah, yeah. later in the book. Yeah, there is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, th- there's actually a, a Sven Hassel website where they've actually th- they've <laughs> they've got Porter's recipes <laughs> from the books, exactly as they're written in the books. But yeah, P- Porter's tall stories, which um, which the old man always kind of suspects the tall stories, but Porter always says, you know, I am Corporal Joseph Porter by the grace of God in Germans in the German army, and I never lie, and I never embellish, and I know these details because I remember them like they were yesterday. But basically, he tells this story about being captured by some Russians and posing as their padre, That's right. <laughs> as, yeah, as yeah, their yeah. priest, because the other yeah. priest, the other priest, I think, what do they say? Did the other priest get sent away for being a dirty nonce or? Sh- or something. Oh, I can't remember. Colin. Yeah, I th- I but th- yeah, he's, he's, I can't remember how he's come about. Yeah, but he's, he's th- convinced th- them that I'm your, I am your yeah. Orthodox priest. I think yeah. I think he says their previous. He refers to a pope. He says their previous pope got taken away and shot for molesting, for molestation, <laughs> or something. <laughs> Um, so, so he ends up, he ends probably up, on the advice of Porter. Yeah, he probably told him that he was a molester. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he ends up uh, taking their services, and at one point, as um, because the the Russians are particularly, um, as as far as he's concerned, particularly given to you know kneeling and praying and all this business, he's, basically because of his great oratory skills, he has like half of a Russian tank regiment on their knees praising God, and then uh, and then there's a little anecdote about um, fallen trees. I can't remember. 
but but basically the, the, the chapter is mostly about um Porter's tall story but then we get to probably one of my favorite chapters that's again that's always stirred to which which is called tiny and the legionnaire Oh well, yeah, yeah, that's straight out of a yeah, yeah, straight out of a film. That, that, that it totally of. is, yeah, yeah it yeah. totally is. And basically, this is like the Sven Hassel equivalent of the alley fight in They Live. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could you could put this in loads of different stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So because 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 like the little John, the kind of yeah, the guy in the dirty dozen, the one who you know the that's big right. the big strong destroys everything. Yeah, doesn't yeah, do it, a lot on the thinking. It it's basically it's, it's, it's posy. Isn't he yeah. out the dirty dozen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's 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 in a hundred stories, isn't he? Yeah, he's, yeah. he's seven foot tall. Is is yeah. is an asshole. Is a bully, um, but he's he's one of the, he's one of the key one one of the main Sven Hassel characters. I suppose if you isolate the four main characters outside of Sven himself over the course of all the books, there's the old man, there's Porter, there's Tiny, and there's the Legionnaire. And then there's a few other characters which um, come in and which are important characters for long periods of time. But these are the four characters that have been there throughout. And and in some ways, um, Tiny is kind of like... I always used to get Tiny and, po- and Pluto mixed up a little bit because they're both massive blokes. But Tiny is just a big, awful, thick bully. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so they're in there. We, they refer to Tiny f- for the first time. And it's almost like it's been there all along. It's like, oh, Tiny's there. And uh, they see a, a short guy at the bar. So Tiny goes and starts a fight with him. And the little guy says, let's step outside. And then basically kicks fuck out a Tiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, yeah. and, and it turns out he's... T- Tiny does do what everybody else was wanting to do at that point. Yeah. He's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so he takes him down, grinds his face into the gravel, turns it to dog meat and makes a real mess of Tiny. Turns out the Legionnaire, he's called the Legionnaire because he's Alfred Kalb and he's, he's a former French foreign legionary who was imprisoned for three years for serving with the foreign army and has now rocked up in the penal regiment. And it turns out from 11am that day, he's part of their company. So Tiny comes back in, washes his face, offers his hand, says, no hard feelings, chum. The, the Legionnaire takes his hand, so Tiny pastes the Legionnaire. <laughs> but then you get these, these really amusing, like, sort of little back and forth anecdotes of how um, over the next three weeks, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they keep taking action against each other. They yeah, have kill each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at one point, um, the Legionnaire puts ground glass in, in Tiny's mushy, in, in Tiny's pea soup. Doesn't he lock him in somewhere? And, and that, yeah, in. so then the Tiny gets his arm back on the Legionnaire, and then eventually the trick Tiny into a big drum and basically right. seal him in it, bolt him in it, and then the Legionnaire puts Scaldy Not Steam in there. That's right. So so Tiny, is, they don't see him for three weeks and he comes back still bandaged up and all blistered and fucked up and he's about to, he pulls a knife and he's about to kill the Legionnaire, at which point Porter points a gun at Tiny and they realise actually, you know, the Legionnaire's all right, he's one of us now. But that is some hazing process. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a strong initiation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So You've they've got, got to go you, through this you, ridiculous you earn your badge. process. <laughs> you earn your badge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, so that's our introduction to two, of really, of the of the key characters. And the Legionnaire in the film is played by David Patrick Kelly. You remember? Warriors come out to play. Oh, yeah, 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 he yeah, plays yeah, the Legionnaire. Yeah. Yeah. Really? yeah, he plays the Legionnaire in the movie. And he, he plays, oh. it, plays it pretty well as well. How did this film not work? Uh, Which script writer well, ruined you this? You know what? To me, it works. <laughs> for, I, I'm really fond of it. For for a cheap, straight-to-video piece of trash, I'm really fond of it just for what it is. Um, and Tiny, I can't remember the name of the actor who plays Tiny, oh. but look up the cast later on. Google the cast, because the actor who plays Tiny, out of all of them, possibly has had the best career. He ended up being in Oliver Stone movies and stuff like that. He's, he plays like uh, one of the... Key like FBI lawyers or something in JFK, the Oliver Stone film. Yeah, he went on to have a really successful career. And then um, the 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 last chapter before they go back to the Eastern Front basically is Sven goes and gets his leg over, and it's 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 a bit of a if yeah, a if it weren't written in 1959, you'd think it was an 80s action film love scene. Yeah, or oh, any love scene going back. Yeah. you know, just but there's lots random. of random. Lots yeah. of cupping of breast and, and all that. But, you know, I, I suppose, in a way, it is quite sweet and sensitive in the air husband's away at war and she wants a bit. And um, Sven yes, wants a bit that's... before he goes to war. And I guess that's just what... I bet that happened a lot. I bet that did happen an awful lot. And, yeah. And, and, and I, I got some of the, you know, like you say, the fun bits. I've, I've heard descriptions of how soldiers behave and carry yeah. on. And, and some of the... I, I had the privilege of... Uh, 
and my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, my mum got loads of his ex Navy, uh, ex crewmen. And, I thought you were going to say that, the, that, that yeah. anniversary you cooked some breast. No, no, unfortunately, well, I wouldn't, not, not. Not for the age of the ladies that were there. It'd have been, uns- <laughs> <laughs> It'd have been a big cup. Um, no, they were, all the crewmen were there and they were just sharing all sorts of just silly stories of things that they did in between in between the horrors of being on patrol and fighting. Yeah. And just some of the stuff they got up to, you know, getting their hands on the hull of one ship's uh, rum ration yeah. and, and the consequences of that. The fights every time the rum barrel came round on ship. Uh, finding my granddad and his mate unconscious after they'd found the key to the officer's mess yeah. one night watch and having to go around the waking them up cleaning up all the sick um <laughs> and then having to go around the boat because the watch the the, the uh, officer's inspection was due of the watch in about 10 minutes turning all the clocks back two hours when the watch was actually and then you know sorry getting the watch done then having by the time they cleaned up resetting all the clocks while he was asleep and getting back up. He'd only had an hour's kip, and he yeah. was kind of a bit suspicious. But trying to, you know, just the, the silly, silly things they got up to, 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 to kind of get away from the distress they were in, the drinking, the fighting, the going to clubs in Europe that they'd never seen the likes of before in their life. Yeah. There, there, is, there is one little bit at the end, actually, which is, again, one of his typical little throwaway things, but kind of, kind of carries some emotional heft. And it's before it goes. He says... Uh, I wrote my field parcel number on a piece of paper, 23645. You should press the scrap of paper against the breast. And it's like, you know, he's, he's, he's now off to the front and in, and he's his only source of any kind of communication outside of the men he's going to be with is this woman he's just had a very brief dalliance with and he's like giving her that piece of paper going, silently saying, will you write to me? And and that's 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 quite impactful. Cling, clinging to clinging to any uh, part thought of existence or anything that will keep you alive or, or uh, known of or mm. hoping to be known of or yes. be around it must be a must be just a constant thing. Yeah, you know the the thought of existence ending at any moment for them. Yeah, just and just not, clinging to, to not be forgotten even when you're yeah. still alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So to the, know that somebody the fact that someone's even thinking about you. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's a distraction from what you're in. That's right, that's right, and that's uh, that's the last chapter we'll cover on this show because next chapter, back to the Eastern Front, we'll get into that in part two. So, overall impressions, and would you read Mars Van Assel? Um, not without a team of psychiatrists. I think. <laughs> um, I think what would be really I, I, interesting. Well, I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd read his first book. Yeah. I think I think you've, as usual, hit the nail on the head. I think and seen. I can imagine the later books are just, you know, there will be some there will be some real experiences of what people have seen at various things and other stories, yeah. and maybe that he's tried to then embellish into a whole book. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd recommend reading Legion of the Damned. It's I don't think it's quite as well developed, but it is it is a great book. And if you wanted to just kind of continue what is really a, a three book arc, then there's Comrades of War and March Battalion. The rest of them. I don't think I would worry too much about because the, the, you start to get a little bit of repetitiveness and, and they become a little bit more adventure novel. But there are a couple where there's one, for example, and I, I can't remember which one it is. There's a couple of books that are they're basically like three short stories, they're like three novellas strung together that don't necessarily connect to each other. And that's what I mean about them being like, you know, full of vignettes. But there's one of them, um, one of the kind of novellas, the 60 or 70 or 80 page sections, um, none of them are in it. It's all about an officer who gets um, sent to uh, to prison and and the horrendous experience he has in prison being basically tortured and brutalised before he's shot. And it's it's really horrendous, but, kind of, but again, compulsive page turn in reading. But then I would probably think, you don't worry about any of them, but then just one day read The Commissar, the last novel he wrote, which is basically Kelly's Heroes, as if it was the Sven Assel gang finding the gold, just to kind of see how he how he, he veers so wildly away from this really authentic, brutal, matter-of-fact picture of war to... Kelly's Heroes. Yeah. We've all done the first album and then the tenth album. That's right. It's not, it's not quite as good, is it? Right. It's not quite got that same emotional ring to it. Yeah. But that's Once cool. you're under pressure from the publishers. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. And, and, and anybody who's interested in any of that, I mean, it's Stalingrad and all of the, there's lots and lots of literature now that's come out over the last ten years about what went on. Hmm. 
around what what he's writing about, and it's like you say, downfall, and uh, there, there's there's incredible literature out there about it. Mm. Ivan's War. There's there's lots of stuff. Mm. And f- actually, if 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 you fancy reading uh, a book by a British author, which to some extent gets anywhere near to the frankness and bleakness and dark humour in places of Sven Asselbuck. There's a book called Death of a Hero, written by a guy who served during World War I. And I forget the name of the author. But when I read that, I was really surprised, because it was written in the 20s, and it's got F-bombs, it's got bad language, it's um, got really quite stark and terrible uh, descriptions of artillery bombardments and being underneath them and what they were like um, i will dig that out but at the time when it was published it was really controversial and it was ended up being published in an edited version and it was never published in a, an unedited version until the copy i got from pops and i think that was a copy from the 60s but it's, it's a book i've never seen in a bookshop and i've never seen a copy of it anywhere else yeah okay. death of a hero well worth a look if you can if, um, if you can find a copy well, I'll have a look because I think I might be able to. Hmm. I might have. I might have yours. No way. I might. well have it. Ah, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. I'll I'll double check on the. Uh, I think I know where it is. Right. I no way. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's yeah, reminded because me. Because if I was to say now, where is it? I won't. <laughs> I won't have a clue. No, I, I think won't have a clue I know where it is. Right. Okay. Well, I must have lent you that at Peel Street when we were in the middle of a haze. <laughs> Very probably. Very probably. Oh, man. But that, that's I've got the this, I just read this amazing book, man. <laughs> well, the, the, those people just didn't get published, no. did they? No, that's right. I mean, you know, you how you got... It was luck, I think, that these people got the opportunities to be published. Yeah. So some editor who thought it was worth giving it a go mm. usually got... You're more likely to get published through social networks than, than ability, I should imagine, most of the time. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, if you do if you do rustle that up and find it, let me know. But sure, for now, sure. thanks for coming out to play. It's all right. It's been good catching up. Mm. And uh, we will see you again for part two uh, some point very soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Massive thanks to Robbo for taking the time to join me in Derry and Tom's. Now, we had a few sound issues with this recording and it took a lot of messing around to sort out my end because I drunkenly failed to pay attention to my gain and I had a lot of clipping. And at Robbo's end, where at times it sounded like someone was sanding his desk. We'll learn from that for next time when we go full bore into the hell of the Eastern Front in part two. You may also spot some inconsistencies in the sound across the different elements of this show. Despite being a slow learner, I am a relentless tinkerer and I'm trying out different microphones and audio hub combinations as I go, so please bear with me. In other news, more excellent Mococ literature has hit my doormat in the form of Jim Kirkland's Dreaming City Books publication of Urish's Horde, The Guide to Elric Collectibles. I mentioned the Kickstarter for this guide on previous shows, but this terrific volume is now available in print and is excellent. Special mention has to go to the absolutely gorgeous cover by Mark Jackson. Grab it. Admire it and support Jim's work. Meanwhile, Jed Design has released the staggeringly beautiful The Stormbringer Sessions, Sketches for a Graphic Novel, by James Cawthorn. It's available in two editions, one limited and numbered in a slipcase, and the other as standard, and I strongly recommend you get down Jed Design and take a look. And on the automatic pre-order front, Saga Press is releasing the Elric Saga in three hardbound illustrated volumes starting in September 2021, so empty out your coin purse, Find a Melnibonian gold dragon and get them in your basket, because I reckon they're going to be marvellous. And time now to thank our equally marvellous patrons. We'll begin with our Chaos Engineers, and despite their best efforts, the good ship Domblas is now approaching the dark straits of Reglathium. Brute of Lashmar is delighted, the masochistic fool. But thanks anyway to Andrew Cyclunus, Nelbert, Robbo, of course, Andrew Van Ness, David Vashman, aka Cernus, John Lays, John Timothy Watt, Jim Kirkland, Simon Perrins, Mal Pertwee, Ben Fletcher, and Fred Keish. Thanks for the tip about the Saga Press releases, Fred. And thanks to our crafty Jugaderos. They gambled on the stout backs and arms of the engineers, but rolled snake eyes. And they are Randall Gatlin, Taylor, Craig, Greavesy, Loz, Tom Murphy, Alex Harris, Clarkey, The Duck Pond Sailor, Ian Stead, Matthew Broom, and Stephen Round. And of course, to our patron demons, Lord Norman of the Higher Worlds, 
baking something based upon a porto recipe. It does involve a lot of pork. To Joe Monte, composing new and epic sagas from his mountain perch above the bleak and ancient Arctic wastes of New Jersey. Anthony Picante, crafting observations from the stuff of the universe. Check them out in Dark Matter, issue 2. The Lapsed Gamer, sailing the seas of fate. And by sailing, I mean walking. And by seas, I mean desert. And by fate, I mean inevitable doom. To the Destiny Knight, Neil Burton, banging out the art like some kind of machine and hoping his fingers don't fall off before he's finished. To Bob McMillan, sender of card, master of haiku, writer of letters, and newsman of the Middlemarch. To Dread Mortman, yearning for the return of the Duke and all associated tasty victuals, and pondering the feasibility of a plume martini. And to Nathan, aka Coram Metal, always shredding, but also considering ways to make jazz especially ghoulish. That's all for today. Lieutenant Connolly has some time off for recuperation, but he'll return in a couple of shows' time. Until next time, you can gab with us and follow us on Twitter and Instagram on the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email the show at breakfastruinsoutlook.com. The blog is breakfastintheruins.com, and we have our Patreon page too. And that has a few Patreon exclusives, including the upcoming chapbook version of Volume 1 of the journal. So, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you again soon on the Moonbeam Roads.